Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Engineering Project Management Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping project managers sharpen their project management skills. My name is Matthew Douglas, and I'm the Operations Leader of the Engineering Management Institute. And in today's episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Karuna Romanovic a transformation coach and consultant from KR Consulting in Singapore. And we'll be talking about organizational leadership and discuss the vital skills that every effective project manager should possess. Dr. Bruno will also provide some great strategies for overcoming challenges in remote work and explaining how project managers can ensure their team stays aligned with the company's mission and values. But before we jump in, here's a quick word from our sponsor today, PPI, the Catholic company. This episode is brought to you by PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the FE and PE exams. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the FE exam the first time. PPI has helped engineers achieve their licensing goals since 1975. Their courses and review materials are based on decades of experience. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. When you take a live online course, we guarantee that you'll pass, or you can take the live on-demand course for free. With study guides, practice exams, and more. PPI Learning Hub is the go-to destination for FE exam prep. PPI Learning Hub offers digital practice and review that you can take with you anywhere that you have a device so that you can prepare during the times most convenient for you. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all of the options available for FE exam prep. Again, that's ppi2pass.com. All right, everybody, welcome back. It's now time for our PM Conversation of the Week with Dr. Karuna Ramanathan. Dr. Karuna, welcome to the Engineering Project Management Podcast. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background in the organizational leadership and how you became interested in this field? It started way back uh, 40 years ago when I uh, left school and looking out for opportunities. I actually had the privilege of joining the Navy and and I spent 20 years, 19 years in the Navy, and I did two ship tours, and I got trained in leadership formally, and I led teams and crews and made big mistakes, got away with it. Uh, look, looking back now, it's just amazing how, how much I actually learned during that period. And then after that, I had an opportunity to actually kind of look at it academically. And I spent uh, about a decade in the leadership center in the Singapore Armed Forces. So I had about 30 years in the military in uniform, retired uh, at the age of 50 and spent three years in government leading conversations with senior leaders in the organizational development leadership piece. And uh, after that, that was since the last six years or six over years, I've actually been doing this professionally and independently. And uh, we are really proud, we meaning I lead a small team of associates, uh, we are really proud to have uh, successfully helped many organizations do this. So it's been a lifetime of learning, Matt. And and I, I think uh, as I as I uh, cheekily say, I have so many mistakes that I wish you'd never do it. I mean, like that's really where this is. So forty years of lived experience, and and uh, of course I have a PhD in leadership, which I picked up when I was in the leadership center, and and I've spoken at a lot of conferences and events. I do specific work in narratives and tacit knowledge and. And all that stuff, but but uh, these days I also coach quite a bit for the last fifteen years, and and uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, transformational work. So organizations are now in major transformation stages. Uh, change is everybody's preoccupation and pain. Uh, we all don't like doing that, and so the specialty that I bring to the table is how could we navigate the complexities a little better. Uh, and I think that's really where we find a lot of well-intentioned project managers. Uh, struggling a little bit because there are no longer set pieces to have to do things. And so I, that's the introduction uh, to Karuna. Wow, that's uh, actually a lot to take in right now. So you are a veteran. Uh, tell me a little bit about your time with the Navy and you said with the Armed Forces as well? That's right. So so at 19, I, I, I looked around after school and and one thing to stand on my own two feet, I signed up in the Navy and uh, I had, unbeknown to me, the results that came out from my school living exams were good enough to send me on a scholarship. And I actually got the privilege to attend the Britannia Royal Naval College in the UK. And, and that was really my first introduction to leadership. It was 365 days of leadership, military leadership. 
and and that was day in day out. You were being observed. You were being basically put through the put through the stages and 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 the steps. And and then you begin to realize that leadership is not about you; it's about the others. And and basically, you then need to lead other people. And that's really not going to be about your power. It's actually your position is going to help you, but you need to be relatable to others. And and we learned a lot of that. Uh, while we were there, and I remember at the end of the at the end of the one year program, I was given a stack of books to go read uh, on the professional areas. And now you can start reading these books because you actually have that leadership training. Now a lot of organizations can't do that because uh, the investment is huge, right? I mean, and so the military does do a little bit of this quite, and they do it in the U.S. as well. Uh, but that's time. So in, in, during my time in the Navy, I've attended programs in the U.S., in Sweden, in a few other places in the U.K. And uh, I've actually done 11 years of sea time. I spent two years in Australia with our Australian Navy. So it's been, it was a wonderful learning journey, uh, getting to, getting to mm -hmm. sample different leaders and work with really good leaders. And I must say some leaders that are quite questionable as well, um, as we all have experiences like this. And, and at the age of, basically at the age of 38, I decided enough was enough. I had two young children. I had to step off the ships because the separation was actually quite significant. And just as I was trying to leave the Navy, and another opportunity presented itself to work in the leadership center. And I spent 10 good years there uh, learning more about the techniques and tools associated with leadership. I picked up a PhD, or prepared for a PhD there as well, and did some really good experimental work. Uh, we were trying to shift the culture of the military from a command and control yelling, screaming, telling to a learning, nurturing, coaching. And I think it took us about eight to 10 years to do that. It remains a very proud piece of work for the team that did that. And I was really privileged to be part of that team. Armed with that then in government, um, you just quickly see the differences. So I was able to experience uh, quite, not quite the same environment. And of course, it's tempting and superficial enough to think that, that that system there is superior to this system. And then you start to realize that leadership is a lot about context. And underpinning that is the culture. And, and everyone has a right to be different. And, and so I actually had to experience that a bit. I was senior enough in the government to actually be in, the, in, in a company of very senior leaders in conversation. So the learning there was tremendous as well. And that's where I picked up an appetite for transformation and change because the Singapore government was actually and still is going through a transformation. And, and I was really proud to be part of that, small part of that. Uh, in terms of fostering those, designing and fostering those conversations. And for the last six over years, I've been actually doing that, Matt. I mean, like that's precisely what we do. And now we dive a little deeper into middle managers, which is why I was interested in this topic, because middle managers are project managers, you know, they're project leaders. And, and as transformation, as the intensity of transformation picks up, the attention we need to give the middle is higher than ever. So, so that's really where I am right now. I hope this is a brief enough introduction. Well, no, no, you're you're giving a, a lot of good information so far, and I'm I'm very very happy that you're actually giving that to us. Um, I mean, it seems like you've just traveled all over the world, and uh, you put in a lot of uh, time and effort in, into your service uh, with the Singapore government in uh, developing leaders and, and you know taking leadership programs and uh, things of that nature. But in your opinion, what are some essential skills and qualities that every effective organizational leadership possess? Like what, what what should they do in order for them to become an effective leader? And when it comes to managing projects successfully for that matter? A lot has been said about this topic. And I think it's important, at least from my perspective, to differentiate between leaders and leadership. Uh, it might help a little to realize that leaders are positional. I mean, basically you earn the right to occupy a position and you have some control either over people at work or you have some, you know, basically it's an organization or some team. And that makes you a leader, but it does not assume that you have the leadership for that position. Now, the leadership for that position has to be earned. It's largely a process of influence. And it means very simply, Matt, relatability to others and how you re basically relate around the work. And it has it looks very surfacey like but it goes a lot into self-awareness self-management and for a lot of people actually that comes as doesn't come as second nature because it's not in the consciousness and so some of the programs that we attend some organizations actually put people through programs and and they actually give them some workshop whatever that might be it actually does arouse a little bit of that awareness but it's often quite incomplete for a lot of people because there's a whole range of issues and variables that actually dig that up. 
uh, for example, your personality, your psychological needs. There's a whole lot of stuff, right? And a lot of us don't have the benefit of that early in our careers. And this is where it's actually becoming pretty uh, difficult for organizations because it directly relates to the ability to flex, adapt, and change. And, and that in organizations, at least in Singapore and in our region, a lot of that leadership dollar in terms of the training dollars is confined to the senior people or the people who are identified as talent very early. So what it simply means is you're looking at three to 5% of an organization. I mean, you're not looking at a 30% who are actually a project managers, middle managers, supervisors, team leaders who actually need to be kind of reset, awakened, to become more curious about themselves. And these are good people who are feeling rather, rather compressed right now in organizations. So, so that's really where things are at this moment, I think. So important to come back to the question, maybe to tease apart leaders, which are largely positional, to leadership, which is a process of influence. Mm. Now, I heard you say something very key, adapt, flex, and change. And I think that that's very, very uh, uh, pertinent, especially in my organization and um, in our industry. Um, us specifically as civil engineers. Um, so what, what role do you think that flexing, uh, adapting and changing really plays in, uh, in your organization? And how's, how do you think that somebody can actually be successful in accomplishing that, the flexing and adapting and the changing? And where can that actually take them in their career? I want to start by saying that it's not um, something that's difficult to gain. Because you do that at home with children. Right. <laughs> let's, let's bluntly put it. Um, we, are, we are schooled in management to pay attention to what our bosses want. So we look up and we, with whatever resources we are allocated, and that's leader position, we try our best to get the job done, the task, the project. So we're looking Absolutely. up and we're looking down. All the time we're looking up and we're looking down. The, the consequence of that is you're not necessarily looking to your left and right. The moment we get home, we are looking to our left and right. Because we, if, what it simply means is, if, Matt, if you're looking up, you're looking at your parents as to how, how, to, how to work your family, right? And you're not going to do that. We don't do that here. I'm sure you guys don't do that there. And you can't simply be uh, commanding your children. They're not going to listen to you. Mine are 30 and 27, by the way. And, and, and they're certainly not going to listen to you. I mean, seriously. So, so basically with that, you are actually having to look left and look right. Now, what does that mean in the context of an organization, particularly one that's going through change post-pandemic? And almost every organization has got some change agenda now, right? So basically, we are going to have to do cross-functional work which means there are people and resources and more importantly, knowledge. Knowledge translated simply means data, information, and wisdom that's sitting in to our left and right that we might not be conscious. We might not be too bothered. Our, our, our left-hand column, which is the voice in our head, might be telling us, I don't like him, I don't like her. So the, the ask on the table right now is, how do I actually work cross-functionally, and that would require adapting. Uh, that would require coping with loads. Uh, how do I work with people whom I don't instinctively agree with, or maybe I've been rubbed the wrong way you know, at a meeting quite accidentally? How do I work in areas that I don't necessarily have enough knowledge, confidence? Uh, I, you know, I don't feel too good doing this because I'm, I'm actually predisposed yeah. to success. I'm just so this is the new ask, and that's what we mean by coping, adapting. You know, because if not, there's just no way a work group on it's actually in a waterfall in terms of an org chart, organizational chart, can actually carry out the increasingly complex work that's demanded in the org. And I think, I think McKinsey, I'm just, I, I just got the book, you know, the, the, the three McKinsey, I, I'm, okay, I mean, McKinsey does a lot of great work and a lot has been said about you know, big four and big six, but they actually put out a book on the middle manager. And I think the middle manager is a very understated uh, capability in many organizations today. So this adapt is you're going to have to look very simply left and right more 
than simply looking up and down. Worse still, man, I mean, you're going to find that people in the organization, the bosses don't know the essences. I mean, some of them think they do, but most people don't. And, and so it's incumbent on the middle manager, in this case, the project managers, the team leaders, to actually look left and right. Some of them do that quite naturally because they are quite relational. Again, it's a function of personality and needs. But most of us, in my experience, struggle with that because we default to the known, the order, the rules, the no, 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 this is not something I'm comfortable with. And that's really the ask on the table now. How do we get middle managers to flex, to kind of stretch their hands out rather than simply look up and down? Uh, that's, I hope I'm making sense. No, that makes complete sense. But let's add another level of complexity to this equation, right? How do you deal with remote work and digital transformation in this day and age? I mean, like we're in an age now of of AI and people working on Microsoft Teams or Zoom or whatever it may be working remotely. How do you actually integrate that into your processes and your business flow? And what are some key challenges and and uh, that you face and that your leaders face in managing and leading project teams effectively from a distance. How do you go about doing that with remote work and this explosion of remote work now? I just read a newspaper report this morning that said that unions in Australia were clamoring or rather fighting back the need for workers to go back to the office. You know, there's a huge movement there in Australia. Right? Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, quite so serious. You could look it up on the internet. I, I would just tell you that uh, when my clients ask me this, I say there's only two models. Let's step, let's take a step back. I mean, pandemic aside, let's pull back to pre-pandemic days. There were only two models. One was the co-location, which was the dominant model, and there was the select remote model. And, and we knew that virtual teams, we had all that going on. Now, the conditions and the conditions for these two models were rather straightforward. The major dominant model, co-location, get into the office, get to the water coolers, get to the pantry, and we're going to have all that knowledge exchange and camaraderie. And you could call it culture. It's, it's conveniently right. labeled, right? But the remote model carried some conditionalities, Matt. It simply meant that the task assigned was discrete, competence was not in question, and deadlines or timelines were negotiable and agreed upon. It's almost a contractual relationship with a remote worker. So if you take someone in London, right? I mean, they don't want to commute to the London main office. They might be staying on the, on the east side of the coast. They would have to have a two and a half hour train ride. Like it is in the US, you know? And basically you then have this person checking in maybe twice or three times a month or whatever the case might be. But this is an agreement which is laid out in terms of the work and the delivery. So you don't get paid. Simply by being an employee, you get paid because you deliver the work. And that's where all these contractual part-time arrangements came in. But let's go back to the conditions. Are you competent enough? And can you be depended upon to deliver a piece of work largely on your own? Now, we go fast forward. So the pandemic threw all that out of whack and basically got us to a point where we, we kind of, some of us were distressed with staying at home and working. I mean, particularly in Singapore, I mean, we have very small apartments. And so you find, you, you, we found many of us actually cramped in dining tables with, you know, with, with a lot of distraction and trying to manage work. But I know in, in, uh, in Europe, in the US, you actually have home offices and you can actually carve out a space and you can actually create that off home office, which you can't pretty much do here because land is scarce, right? And houses are really small, plants right. are really small. So with that then, it became a lifestyle thing because what you also have here is a younger generation, younger relatively, that actually prefers that independence and the commuting becomes an issue. So I take my son, for example, 27 years old. I mean, he could not spend an hour and a half just taking a bus and a train to work. <laughs> and then he said, this is a waste of time. I can be so productive. But that's a generational thing for a large part. Now, here's where the problem is. I mean, do you really give the employer choice yes there's a lot of stuff coming out now on employee experience how they will leave you and go away if you don't give them the choice but the larger question that begins is and this is something for leaders are you really really making an assessment on the competence of your team and 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 really what does that mean what does competence mean is it is it qualifications is it demonstrated skill is it reliability is it proficiency is it is it dependability what is it you know, 
And that's the dig out that needs to accompany this decision with hybrid or choice work. And and we'd be very surprised with some of the some of the feedback we get when we raise this with clients. You know, it's like, how do you do this? It's pretty easy, don't you? I mean, there's several models around to actually determine competence. But the boss needs to understand that there's some in the team who can do this better than others, and then decide what kind of leeways to cut whom. Now, and here's also where this decision is not a HR policy. This is a line policy. It depends on the middle manager. It depends on the project manager. And we do that, Matt. If someone wants, I mean, we've all worked with, with colleagues. If someone needs a bit of time off, you say, yeah, go take, you take a week off and deal with this. Um, but I'm I'm sure you will get the work done somehow or the other because we have that we have that. But if you just join me, you know, three months into it, I say, hey, wait a minute, maybe we need to sit down more often and talk about this. And and so right. that's the kind of that's being a leader, which now means what has happened now with the hybrid working remote arrangements or whatever the case might be is a manager simply can't look at the work. A manager needs to look at people, and that means trying to assess every individual for his or her beautiful differences and work that. And how are you going to do that if your head's in the work and you keep looking up and looking down, looking up and looking down and not looking around? So, so that's really where we are now. So it's pretty distressing for some of our middle managers because, because hey, what's the company policy? But it's, it's, that's pretty superficial. It, it needs to dig down. Uh, as we have children, no two children, no two kids are the same. <laughs> Right. <laughs> no, I definitely understand that. I mean, I have three myself and all of them are different. And that really speaks to your point about like how uh, really getting to know all of your team members on like a more cognitive level is uh, definitely going to help you become more effective in leading them in your okay. leadership efforts. You know, like you have to definitely understand the personal skills that they have and how they actually are as a person and uh, what they can and cannot take. Uh, when they can and cannot, you know, uh, uh, work on certain deliverables for some certain people, especially with this remote work explosion that we have going on right now. A lot of people are not exactly able to work during the traditional nine to five hours that we have. You know, like a lot of people, um, sometimes myself even, yeah. are people that work a lot of the time when the kids are asleep and, totally. and you get a lot totally. of work done. You know, I, I find for myself personally that um, if I'm actually trying to work remotely, um, which I do right now, um, if I actually try to work remotely, getting work done during the day is a much harder task than getting it done at night. Oh, I totally. might take eight hours to do very, very simple tasks during the day because I have a lot of noise um, you know, kids running around and stuff, asking questions, asking for snacks and things of that nature. But then in the midnight hours or 10 to, to one or two o'clock, I'm able to get eight hours of work done within four hours. And at the end of the day, the deliverable is done. You've gotten what you needed and we're able to move the project forward. So that actually drives me to my next question here which is how can project managers overcome these challenges to ensure seamless com collaboration and communication? So which ways do you actually practice communicating with your team members? Like, is there a certain software that you, that you use or is there like an open door 24 seven policy? I like to use that sometimes. And sometimes I know that my managers actually get uh, might get a little flustered with me because sometimes I might send an email at 2 a.m. But it's not to say that I actually want you to respond at that hour. Yeah, it's just yeah. that if I don't send it at this hour, I'm probably going to forget to send it the next day. And then that delays the process of actually getting the work done. But which ways do you actually practice, um, you know, actually you know, incorporating that seamless communication between your team members? I think uh, for us in Singapore, we use WhatsApp a lot, I, you know, just basically on the phone and everyone's got their mobiles with them all the time. We need to put some barriers there. I, I found myself guilty of actually sending something to a colleague on Saturday or Sunday and I've just held back and said, stop it. Right. So basically I said, don't do that. Wait until Monday and wait until 
And I have this bad habit, Matt. You know, I'm up at 4, 4.30 most mornings and I do amazing, really nice, quiet work from about 5 to 7. When I was younger, I used to use yep. the time for, pee, for, for for going for a run. But as I get older now, I just use the time to actually crack up what I need to do. And I was up early this morning doing that as well. But I hold myself back from sending a message or an email until 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. So that's it, it's, it's just pretty much a little bit of self-awareness and a little bit of a discipline. Just hold it. Do not turn. Just do not let it go because you might be busy enough, but you know someone else might receive it differently. And that that I think the word I'd use for that is respect. Let's respect each other, and and that that's one. The second point I'd like to make is uh, some of us are predisposed to control. I mean, it is a psychological need. I mean. Well, I mean, the extreme of that is micromanaging and, and the lack of awareness as to how much of a press on you are on your team or your, your work group, right? But that's psychological. The point here is from, from a consulting, from a coaching point, how we normally help our clients is we say that if you kind of know that it's actually something that's been repeatedly done, then you need to tell your team to go get it done based on what was done. It's as simple as that. It's called audit space. It's called simple and obvious. It's called just a little complicated, but you know, you have some precedent. I think where the team leader needs to step in or the project manager needs to keep an overwatch is when things become a little difficult. And it's quite natural, right? I mean, you want to pay attention right. to things becoming difficult. Now, that difficulty, the problem with that difficulty, is it is it difficult because it's pressing or is it difficult because it's complex? And what we're seeing now in post-pandemic times is that things are becoming more complex. And this is really where the role of the team manager rather than the job of the team manager has widened to the left and right, which means now you can't expect your team members or your work group members to actually go out and seek the data, information and wisdom. But you might have to play that role. Because suddenly a manager is probably going to have more connections and more awareness of the organization than his or her team. And that's really where I think the value add or rather the ask of many uh, managers are at this point. And I think if they're busying, busying themselves with the obvious, then it's really an opportunity cost to that. And in terms of kind of it affects the success of the team. So my simple take on this is uh, fend off the stuff that is simple and obvious. Uh, of course, if the if if your team members knew as the team, you might want to coach or mentor him or her. Say, hey, you know what we did this day. Go take a look at this. Uh, maybe make sure you. Uh, let me just tell you when I did this. I had this is a lovely little trick, right? When I did this a year ago, I made two mistakes. Please don't repeat this. And it kind of sits really nicely. Start with me and end with me. That's being leaderful, you know. I mean, I made these mistakes. I wish not for you. And and basically, I'm here to help you become successful. So try your best not to repeat this. <laughs> You know, right. that's one. But I would keep a watch on the complexity. Now, here's another statistic. And I'll work on the ground in Singapore. I mean, in the last six years, seven years. We found that middle managers, project managers, they would have to deal with about 20 to 30% of complexity, not more than that. If you're, right. if you're dealing with more than that, then obviously you need to rope in your bosses because there would be issues there, you know. But typically now we're going to have to deal with 20%, 25% of complexity. That means your focus should be on the complex rather than the complicated, obvious. It, it, it really That's really what I would suggest out there. So th there needs to be a pullback. And hey, you know, I mean, those are all the hygiene issues with boundaries and all, but let me just give you where my value can be. And, and I think it will be quite reassuring to the team to see the team leader or the project manager actually look at the more difficult parts than to kind of harass them with the obvious pieces. Uh, that's, that's, so there is a relationship between complexity and intervention. I mean, I think the more complex things are, the team member needs to, the team leader needs to show the team that he or she is willing to front it and take it on. Mm. That's very interesting. and. And so our next question, can you share an example of a successful large system change program that you've designed and facilitated for an organization? What were the main objectives of the program and how did you approach the planning and implementation process of that program? Uh, that's a great question. I get asked this quite often, but uh, all transforming organizations will not transform unless the strategy is kind of thought through. So the first thing is the strategy. And I, I say this to senior leaders, right? You can actually buy it. 
you, you can you can pay some consulting group to actually find out for you what the best things might be and and let the management take decisions around that you can go to the board you can do all that but here's where the problem is the 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 more difficult the transformation the larger the collective and that collective is a leadership collective. It means that the C-suite, the minus ones, they are going to have to be in a room co-creating the desire to want to move to a preferred future. Some of the organizations do it very well. Some of the organizations believe they do it well. Most organizations actually fall well short of that because there is a, there is a tendency to confuse strategic planning with transformation and vision. Now, the other problem, as Haifas out of Harvard has said in his great book, Leadership on the Line, which is worth a read, actually is a lot of that vision that we see is actually leadership ambition. And, and it's not quite the same as, as actually coming to collective to decide what now, assuming, uh, Matt, that collective strategy is put together and it's approved and it's funded, whatever the case might be. So you have a plan and the plan is a collective plan. That's called strategy. The next big issue, which is where consultants like me come in, is execution. And execution in simplicity is taking ideas around the transformation strategy and bringing it into the current system. There is a process for that. So in work that we've done with large system change, we have actually worked that quite successfully. Some of them government organizations, a few corporates, uh, but they actually need to look at it at different levels of change, stakeholders, vendors, uh, partners, uh, the ecosystem rather than the organization. Now, that's a new skill for middle managers who lead this. You actually have to help them sense make rather than simply plan. Big shift. Hmm. In planning, we have prescribed steps. In sense making, we have cognitive stretch. And 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 uh, cognitive stretch, yeah, cognitive stretch takes into account uncertainty, difficulty, complexity, ambiguity, and that's a huge ask. But we have been successful in our. I call it. I'm, I'm happy to talk to readers, I mean listeners, separately on this. But it's called change leadership. It doesn't mean change management. It's called change leadership. How do you hold vision? How do you build influence around change teams? And how do you pursue? things that you will obviously have a high chance of failing. And to a lot of middle managers, it's quite disconcerting, right? I mean, having to deal with that. Then the next stage of that, once execution gets underway, it starts to be visible, is whether the narrative is shared enough in the organization. So leaders and managers have to be off the same narrative. We have a way to measure this uh, in terms of basically, as opposed to rhetoric, do people actually believe that this is happening? Are they seeing it? Then we look at a year or two into that transformation and we look at whether the rest of the organization, which is like 70% of people, are actually starting to come to terms with the fact that work is going to change. And it's called the business as usual is BAU is going to change. And that we call the adaptive team leader, which means our objective is to make every middle manager an adaptive team leader so that when the need arises, he or she can look left and right and kind of pick this up instead of resisting change. So in a nutshell, it's strategy, execution, and implementation. And it does take a good system three, maybe three to five years to actually make visible changes. That's been our experience. I've actually advised, uh, I've actually advised Brunei government on this uh, some years back when I was in government. Uh, I've actually advised large government agencies on this. Uh, worked with them, and it's been some marvelously encouraging results on that. These days, uh, KR Consulting, for which I work in, actually, which I lead, actually specializes in measure, measuring the change. So there is a term we use here. In strategy, we say that as a pace. We want to see this happen by a certain time, man. But when we come in and we do work with people, it is about flow. So we can metaphorize flow. It's actually whether people are willing to move at a certain rate and how do we remove obstacles to that? So it all becomes very, it's the mindset stuff. It's the politics. It's the fears and anxieties that people carry. Uh, it's a tough ask, but that's what we do. And we do it. I'm proudly saying that we do that reasonably well. Wow. And, you know, like you, you said a lot of things about adaptation specifically now i want to go from and i mean obviously that there are different levels to adaptation right let's talk about rapid adaptation how do you implement rapid adaptation strategies or when there's a need for rapid 
rapid adaptation in your company? And how do you get your company to follow along with that and pursue their purpose and be able to fulfill all of the needs of, you know, like the, the, the times where you don't exactly have that rapid adaptation? Like how do you get that to match? We get them off on the side. So for change leaders, we actually identify, or the organization identifies a small number of managers. That The logic for that, or the, the rationale for that could be talent or succession planning or whatever. And we put them through an accelerated program, anywhere from four to six months, where they work on real mm-hmm. projects, real projects. And these projects were cut out from the strategy based on the timelines. So there's a logic to that. And we actually spread them across and look at where the highest impact would be. And we teach them to sense make and build con- influence. Uh, of course, there are other techniques like Scrum and Agile and all that do that. But I think the, the, the assumption we are making here is you don't know what you don't know. And so there is a high chance that that idea may not sit in your system or ecosystem because simply an external stakeholder might not like it. And that's particularly the case with government. I mean, it's not as coordinated as it looks. It's just that as an organization, you think this is a great idea, but you're actually quite dependent on a stakeholder commitment and you're not going to get that. The other uh, quite common one that we see is you want to build this digital system, right, Matt? I mean, you actually want to do this digital transformation, but you don't have cybersecurity people. So what are you going to do? I mean, you can't guarantee right. the safety of your... So that's a capability issue. So I'll nail it down to three words, capacity, capability, and commitment. Capacity is whether you have enough people doing it. That goes back to your question. But capability is a larger concern often because you might have the head, the head count for it but you might not have people with the necessary skills and abilities like the cybersecurity piece. And then again, there's also commitment. If your organization and most organizations do not operate on their own, they operate with partners. They operate as part of a larger ecosystem. There is industry, for example, with government. There are vendors and stakeholders. There are partners. There are global partnerships. And and you can't move on your own unless you actually have enough commitment from others. And we teach the change leaders younger people, younger people, to actually pick the skills up very quickly and to question constantly in a safe enough space that is actually kind of nurtured by leadership. So in a nutshell, basically, we create a parallel track for these projects to get to the system. Well, that's awesome to hear. Now, let's. Uh, you said something about commitment, and I want to hone in on that specifically. So with commitment, how do you get your project teams to stay aligned with the company's mission and values, you know, even during times of significant change and project challenges? How do you get them to stay committed to your mission? Yeah, it's a great question again. Wow, these questions. uh, (laughs) The sense-making logic cannot simply be on data, information, and wisdom. It has to be on key anchors. I'll give an example. if you work with the public service, it tends to be integrity. Um, okay. And it's a one it's a one or zero. If you work with another like another organization that I'm working with, uh, it's simply respect. Would we be able to demonstrate respect? Now, what does respect translate into? Inclusivity, diversity, principles like that. And that underpinning rubric is in the consciousness of the change leader and increasingly the adaptive team leader. It is it is part of the decision process to do something and not simply follow traditionally what the manager is told to do. And 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 for some leaders, for some men, okay, so basically we are making every manager a leader of some sort without position, right? So for some, for some, some of us we take that quite naturally, but for I would say a majority that would be quite difficult to stomach in the first mile. And there is a there is a process, which is why you can't possibly do these things in a three-day workshop. You know, you, you have to have intercessionary time. So our programs run anywhere from four to eight months. And and you'll see we have at my backdrop a change, a change, it's called the change leader. You can actually look at it up in the net. It's actually up in life. It's go, it's an app that we have to help managers actually shift their thinking through a staged eight, hmm. eight month step. I mean, it's low cost, right? But we do acknowledge that you need time in between the interventions to sense make who and the, the key pieces. Matt, who do you choose to be at work? 
<laughs> wow. Now, do you have any advice for project managers who are navigating uncertainty in their project? And what exactly does uncertainty mean for you? And how do you guide your project managers or your team to go through that uncertainty to a point where they're actually certain about their projects? It's a difficult question because I'll just go back to my experience. You know, I mean, if you if you are experiencing something that's not clear, then you want to keep your sights in front of you, which means we're going to have to, the world will be probe. We're going to have to probe gently forward and be prepared right. to withdraw when you feel the heat. This is not where yeah. I want to be. I mean, it's a, it's an evil analogy, right? I mean, when there's an unfortunate fire, you just gently touch the bulkhead, right? So basically that, I would say that if, if you're uncertain, the question has to be, is it because you don't know enough of it? that someone else knows. If someone else knows, you need to go left or right and go find out that, find that out. But if if everyone in the organization is dealing with it for the very first time, then the idea here is to take small steps forward and then adopt a learning orientation because whatever data that's going to come out of it is generally exploratory. And the question then is how do you convert that into near-term insights to determine what else you do? And that's the sense making skill that we, we actually teach them to. So a lot of a lot of this is manager work, Matt. It's not data scientist work because uh, quite paradoxically, and I'm going to say this, and I don't know how this is going to sit with people, but I really believe that data scientists and analysts sit in audit space. All that all that data products are good, but when you come to uncertainty actually succumbing or, or actually following something that was proved right sometime back might be problematic. Uh, so managers will have to learn the skill of probing. Going, okay, I, I used to say this years ago in some of the projects that I used to lead, two steps forward, one step back. We build a little, we test a little. We build a little, we test a little and pull it back a little bit. So let's not be ambitious with a one-year or two-year plan. Yeah, no, I like what you said on that. Um, because I definitely believe that uncertainty definitely exists within projects. I mean, totally. ideally, we would like to we would like to uh, not actually have any uncertainty in our projects, but that's just not the reality of the situation. Especially like for a growing organization, um, um, growing in the scope of work of projects that you actually do, you may just have some things that uh, uh, you have not been accustomed to in years past. And like you said, I think that that was just absolutely key. And I mean, I've even taken something from that, you know, taking the two steps forward and the one step back and probing. I think that that's probably the, the major key out of that last statement that you just made, you know, like just uh, gently poking your way forward and kind of finding out, you know, finding your way through the darkness and, you know, uh, cleaning up your mistakes along along the way as you go and figuring things out. But I think that the most important part after all of that is is developing a learning plan after yeah. all of that is done that way that is now something that is added to your arsenal and that's now a project that you now have ma complete mastery oh. over and even if you oh. don't have complete mastery over it you still have some type of, of guideline that you can actually go about using on the next project that might be aligned to that same exact project which you are uncertain of so, totally. And we find no, that I, we set up we set up boundaries. Yes. Just to, just to follow up on that. And as you go forward, you then find an uncertainty. Well, I found an uncertainty. We find that let's not do that. Let's not do that. And let's not do that. And, and that is actually quite reassuring to the team. So I, I start by saying in a project like that, I made this mistake. I made a not a great call. Let's pull back on that. Actually, you want to get the team to, we made this mistake. We might not have read this well. We might need to pull back. And when you get from I to we, it's called team learning and you've got it going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's absolutely key. Um, there definitely is not an I in team, but there is an E and E is in we. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> is there any additional advice or insights that you'd like to give to anybody um, that is in our audience about organizational leadership? or driving positive change within their organizations. Any advice that you'd like to give? I think in our quest to be adaptive team leaders, particularly middle managers, we need to pay a little bit of attention to humility because we are we are actually we are actually programmed to know it all and to do 
whatever it takes and to actually yeah. look at everyone else below us as uh, people who are less capable than us. And I think a little bit of that step back uh, would actually be quite useful from a, you don't have to attend a leadership program for it. I mean, the next time you're on a plane, just think about that. You know, how would someone describe me? And, and am I actually worthy of that description? And, and I go back to this sentence that I always use in my work. Who do you choose to be? I mean, I choose to be someone at work in a certain way, and it's quite a deliberate choice. And you can be too at the age of 25 or 30 or 32, you know. Who do I choose to be? And always carries a humility tag. I, that's what I'll just give as a little piece of advice. Awesome. And where can our listeners actually follow you and learn more about you and what you actually do? Uh, it's the, the website is krk.sg, so it's www.krk.sg. And if you just type Karuna, K-A-R-U-N-A, at krk.sg, you'll get an email to me. I'm normally lousy with re replying immediately, but I'll, get, but I'll get there in due course. So if you have a concern, I'm happy to help you make sense of your world. Busy man. Well, no, I get it 100%. Uh, you're running your own company. You're doing a fantastic job in what you're doing. Thank and we you. Appreciate it. All of the information that you've given to us today was definitely a lot, but we I think that we can definitely take a lot from what you've actually given us today. So we thank you for being on our podcast. And in the That's next real segment, pleasure. Actually, thank you. And in the next segment, we're actually going to go through our PM pitfalls with Dr. Karuna and how he plans on uh, avoiding those pitfalls. Or if you get those pitfalls, how do you deal with those and get uh, get around those things? Um, in our next segment. So we'll take a little break right now and uh, we'll get right back to it. All right, everybody, we are back with Dr. Luna. And right now we are going to go through the PM pitfall segment. And right now I'd like to ask Dr. Luna, what is the biggest PM pitfall that you identified? And how would you recommend overcoming that PM pitfall specifically? I see time and time again, Matt. I mean, it's the deadline versus timeline. Uh, the starting point for project management is of when do you need this by? And so we immediately begin with the end in mind and we pull the timeline back. And, and, and then we end up in a deadline and it puts a lot of stress. And there's a critical part. There are all these methodologies that we learned and basically the software to do that right now. And you find that actually it presupposes certainty and this is a big pitfall because in the projects that we are seeing, particularly with the digital project, you can't do that because there's a lot of left and right. So I would suggest moving from deadlines to timelines uh, and looking at exactly at how you can build a collaborative strength with people who have different sets of data, information, and wisdom to actually strengthen the, certain, the, the successful conclusions of the projects that you're setting up with. So I would simply say deadline versus timeline. I think that that little bit of information is what really did it for me right there. Like just understanding the difference between a deadline and a timeline really does it. Um, because like, if you think about that little minute change right there, like a deadline is like, I mean, it has the word dead in it. Yeah. And I think that the word in itself means, uh, it, it kind of makes you rush when you have a deadline, but when you have a timeline, there's just a simple, timeline of milestones that you are to accomplish along your project and it makes it so that like you have something to kind of look forward to and yeah. of course you don't have the word dead in there so i think that the yeah. word kind of plays a part in it as well but i really appreciate that information because it definitely helps me um in my journey to um you know in my engineering career and i'm pretty sure that it's also going to help our listeners as well so i really thank you and appreciate you for giving all of this information to us today on project management tools and uh, information that we can actually use that all of our listeners can use to uh, uh, really grow as project managers in our career. So I really appreciate you for that. The pleasure is mine as well. Thank you for having me. Wow, that was a really, really explosive episode that we had today with Dr. Karuna. And I really, really enjoyed what we shared today about project management, being in middle management, if that is the case for you. Um, as it is the case for me, and really taking part in your organization to understand processes and really drive your organization forward. 
please remember that you can find the show notes for this episode at www.engineeringpmpodcast.com. And there you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, as well as any of the links, resources, websites, or books mentioned in today's episode, as well as Dr. Kruna's link to his LinkedIn so that you can connect with him professionally. Until then, I wish you all the very, very best in your engineering project management endeavors. Take care. Thank you.